everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Today, finally, the time has come to review Gabrielle Chanel's new fragrance to be launched in September of 2017. Even though they plan to launch it on Mademoiselle Chanel's and Gabrielle's birthday, 19th of August, but then they pre-launched it already in June, July. They're going to launch it all over the place except on her birthday, it seems to be. Or maybe in Paris, they're going to do a special launch on the 19th. Anyway, this is Gabrielle. For those of you who haven't, you can check out many videos uh, made by me um, on Gabrielle, the fragrance, as well as the Gabrielle bag uh, review. I have done an unboxing, first impressions of the bottle. I have done the first impressions of smelling the scent without going into detail uh, the various ingredients, which we're going to do today. And I have also done several interesting videos, relatively new for me because um, they were like speculation videos, like ideas before the, the fragrance even came to the market. We, we kind of discussed, debated together what the perfume would smell like, how, what are our expectations, uh, how we envision or how I envision, you know, Gabrielle to smell like. Um, does the actual fragrance as it is today... Does it match my expectations? Does it match that poetry and the vision that I had of Gabrielle as a fragrance? Um, now I can tell you maybe by 10%. 90% doesn't match at all my expectations. But you can see that I have been testing this really um, in-depth and intensely day and night because, I mean, I've had this fragrance now for a short while, but you could see how much of it is already used up. We tilt it to the side, you can particularly see ASMR. Very thin glass. Okay, I'm going to spray it on. Now, I have it already on my chest since a couple of hours. I want that dry down to whiff into me, but let's spray it on the arm. And here. Now, why do I spray it there and there? It develops differently. The skin is very soft and tender in this area. And it's closer to, to, to the veins and it's closer to the arteries. And it, it kind of is closer to the pulse. It's warmer. It blends better with the skin. A fragrance on this part of the body doesn't really attach itself to the skin. It kind of is more fleeting. It dissipates quicker. There's less heat there. So it does develop differently. This is kind of, you could kind of fake a more cooler development of the fragrance on this part of the body. And here you get more a warm effect. Okay, let's get into uh, Olivier Polge's creation. Olivier Polge is the creator of Gabrielle. Top notes, black currant, grapefruit, mandarin orange, very citrusy. And the current is peppery to me. It's acidy and it bites. So that's the thing that bites me in the opening notes. So straight straight away, right from the from the box. Uh, middle notes, orange blossom, jasmine, ilang ilang, tuberose. Base notes, musk and sandalwood. That's what they tell us is in this fragrance. There is more, obviously. There's always more in a fragrance than what the perfumer decides to tell us. Slightly headache-inducing. I do not like the opening of this perfume. I've said it in my initial thoughts, and unfortunately, I have to stick to that because after testing it out for many days and nights, it just does not um, work with me in the opening notes. It's too citrusy. It bites me too much. There's something artificial in the opening that just does that just does not blend very well with me. If you uh, remember, for those of you who have seen my first impressions of Gabrielle. I did um, kind of send off a little challenge to you guys, a little riddle. I said it reminds me of a certain fragrance. I think it would remind me because I had to really wait for the dry down to, to kick in. Eh, mid notes actually. And uh, I lifted this for a second and um, I asked you if you would guess. Three of you guessed. Nobody else. Three people guessed. And I will reveal what it is as we kick in the mid notes because right now it doesn't smell like it at all. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, what is interesting to note is that the grapefruit, uh, mandarin, you know, they're all like citrusy tones. Um, 
that uh, the top notes are citrusy, and then we also have the orange blossom in the middle notes. You know, Olivier Poche loves his orangey touch uh, as he launched Ovive, and I do love Ovive. I love Ovive speci especially because of its dry down, not because of its blood orange opening, but because of its sandaly, warm, woody dry down, which really becomes creamy on my skin and delicious. And you got to wait for that dry down. But when the dry down arrives, it's majestic. It really does not feel like a flanker uh, to me. Um, Gabrielle has a big problem. And that problem being it's dry down. Now, usually when I review a fragrance, I go into the top notes, then I do the mid notes, and then I go into the dry down. This time around, we're going to skip the mid notes for now. So we did the top notes and we're going straight into the dry down. Um, there's a reason for that. And we'll get to it in a minute. <laughs> the dry down is very cheap. Non-existent, really. It's just not there on the skin, on my skin at least. And it is something that I've noticed, unfortunately, in most of perfumery nowadays. Um, our society lives of, you know, quick emotions, quick satisfactions, quick everything. So a perfume needs to be bitey and aggressive and it has to appear to be special and strong and powerful immediately right in the opening notes. Because I think a lot of these perfume houses believe that that's how, they, that, that's how they're going to get their customers because, you you know, nobody has the time nowadays really to walk, you know, to spray the, the fragrance on the skin and then walk through the perfume shop or through the city for two hours and then feel how the perfume develops, which is how you should purchase a fragrance. That's how you should test it on your skin. And then returning after that to the perfumery store and, you know, then decide whether or not to get a fragrance because you got to let that dry down kick in before you really decide if you like a perfume or not. Gabriel does not have a dry down. Uh, once, and mind you, longevity, I don't really like to talk too much about longevity and project, uh, projection. Maybe sometimes I like to talk about it in terms of, I like a perfume sometimes to project a lot because it protects me from other people because <laughs> I don't like people coming too close to me. And if a perfume is, is too intense, people tend to stay away, which is great. Thank you very much for fragrance that way. Sometimes if you're in the psychological mood for that, but longevity is very poor. And we're talking three hours tops on my skin. And so when the dry down kicks in around the third hour, it's mellowed down to a mere nothing, really. Except, and because I've used up so much of this fragrance, I've been layering it on clothes, on skin, over and over and over and over again. When you really overdo it, then something interesting happens. When you really overdo it, but you can't just overdo it at once, spraying 50,000 times and then letting it settle. You got to spray it, let it dry, spray on top, let it dry, let it layer on textiles in particular. Because I have like some t-shirts that I've been layering on and uh, they still have a particular scent in them of Gabrielle, which is not detectable immediately when you start using the perfume first couple of days. It needs to sedimentate itself in a weird way on top of access, like accessor accessories, I don't mean costume jewelry, heaven forbid, never spray your costume jewelry with alcohol or perfume or oils. But like, for example, it's a hat. if it's a hat, I would spray my hair a little bit, so you put the hat on top, the hat absorb, I spray the hat on the inside as well, stuff like that. Um, this is very fascinating because what I've smelled out is a plummy sort of resiny, like a re resinous, dried, plummy, fuzzy effect after many days of use, which is very reminiscent of a fragrance that I did not sniff out in my first impressions, but I can tell you now, very, very reminiscent in a very watered down concept and idea of it, very reminiscent of Jean-Paul Gaultier's by the power of two. Interesting, isn't it? It's one of Gautier's most um, powerhouse fragrances. They're so resinous and oily that like the color is almost brown gold. It's been discontinued, unfortunately, from the market. I do have a 40 milliliter uh, little spray bottle uh, in the archives and testing it side by side, of course, by the power of two is more intense, but if you're layering Gabrielle uh, over and over and over again on certain, you know, 
jacket, shirts, whatever, collars, hats, after a couple of days, you're going to smell out that peachy, not peachy, plummy, furry, resinousy kind of touch to it, uh, which I um, like, but I don't like it for Chanel. It's not Chanel to me. And so um, it creates a certain warmth. And, and you might say it, that's the tuberose. No, you know, tuberose, I mean, the killer tuberose is in fracas, you know, and I've reviewed fracas. You could check out the review in the description box down below. Coincidentally, I'm wearing the same piece when I'm reviewing fracas because they have a similarity because of this tuberose and this kind of darkness in them. I know that this one is all about light and it's supposed to depict and represent light and the little cross sections are supposed to represent the four, you know, elements that represent the four points of light. <sighs> Olivier, I'm falling asleep already. Dude, like you overdid it with this bottle. I know a lot of you really love the elegance of it. To me, it's just too much. I don't need to over-conceptualize every element of a bottle in order to appreciate the fragrance more. Because if you're going to have to sell to me the concept of a bottle in order to appreciate the fragrance, then I start thinking there's something wrong with the fragrance. Why can't the fragrance talk on its own? Um... On another note, somebody stated, actually Chanel stated, uh, the brand, that it took them five years to develop. But um, that would mean that Jacques Poge was involved in this fragrance because Olivier hasn't been there yet for five years. Because I remember Coco Noir, who, that was developed by uh, Jacques Poge, the father of Olivier, was launched in 2012. So Jacques was still working for Chanel back then, and yet that is five years ago. So... I don't get it. If they really spent five years to develop this, <laughs> then maybe they were kind of reformulating it and retesting it and modifying it all the time and they weren't happy with the results. I don't know why. There's no reason to, especially five years for a bottle like this. No. What really annoys me about the stopper, uh, upon uh, closer inspection, you will notice this is not one piece of metal. These are two pieces of metal that are locked into each other. So the top of the stopper kind of attaches to the bottom and keeps it in place. So every time you lift it, you scratch your fingers on it. I mean, it's not comfortable at all. I won't be able to show you this on camera, but... On every side, I'm going to go with the nail on it. You're going to hear the click, click. This is where the two metals attach. And it just doesn't feel right on the fingers. And it also feels like it could corrode easily because the edges are left open. Mm. Anyway, but uh, why did I not talk about the mid notes yet? Eh, they're kicking in because that's what's magical about this fragrance. Yes, it's not all bad. There's also some something good about it. The mid notes, that ilang ilang and the jasmine and the tuberose, even though this particular tuberose does not shine on me as, um, as the fracas tuberose does, but... The flowers, the flowers are incredible. And they are only there for only 20 minutes on my skin. They, after this um, black currant, unnecessary black currant and unnecessary citrusy fruits, which Olivier loves, but citrus to me is, you know, and then I did my research. Olivier Poge also created Friends, the fragrance Friends for Moschino, which is an extremely Mandarin and orangey and citrusy based perfume, which I had. I purchased it the second it came out because I thought to myself, oh, you know, back in the day, a new, you know, Moschino fragrance. It's going to be amazing. It's the most disgusting perfume I've ever smelled. It's, it's so bad. And because, you know, they use these cheap substitutes for these citrusy orangey tones, which can so easily go so bad uh, if you don't know what you're doing, really. And if you're taking materials and ingredients that aren't, I'm not saying they don't know what they're doing. Of course, they know what they're doing. They're the best perfumers in the world, but it's just, it ain't Chanel to me. So anyway, once that kind of cheap touch of orange and citrus is gone, and then again, the, the orange blossom is also gone, then I get these other flowers. And that's where this perfume, and let's turn it around. So the three of you that have guessed, it is En Fleur de Chanel, by Chanel. This was a Jacques Poche creation in the 90s, then it was re-released in the early 2000s, limited edition only for Chanel boutiques. I have it here. 
was only available as a 35 ml eau de toilette spray. Uh, this one is gorgeous. Mm, tricky, tricky scent because you don't get it immediately. It took me some time to get it also. I made a review of this one many, many moons ago. You could check that one out in the description box down below as well. Uh, there's a similarity between these two. It was stated that this one will be reminiscent of this one in a way. It is. In many ways, it's very different. But those mid notes, which is the only part of this perfume that I treasure, uh, we have the heart of En Fleur de Chanel. En Fleur de Chanel was created as a sort of imaginary scent uh, because, you know, camellias or camellias were loved by Coco Chanel. And since camellia flowers do not have a fragrance, uh, Jacques Pauge um, idealized the smell of a camellia. So he thought if a camellia had a smell, how would it smell? Uh, and the results of his poetic vision of how a camellia would smell is included in this, in this majestic little bottle. And there's tuberose in here. There's ylang ylang in here. Let me spray it on this side. And it's intense and it's, it's a 90s fragrance and you kind of smell out something in there that's kind of shifting towards the 2000s. It's a very time specific fragrance, as will this one become. This one is not timeless, guys. This one smells like 2017. Now, if they started developing it five years prior, I'm sure they modified it bit by bit as the years progressed. And now we are ready to launch it and it has been launched and it does smell like the times we live in. And that soapy resinousy touch that's reminiscent of By the Power of Two by Gautier, something that sticks to it towards the dry down. And that's what makes it not Chanel to me. And this brings me to my, you know, point of Olivier Polge being a great perfumer. I'm not saying he's not good at what he does. He's great at what he does. Dior Homme is an incredible uh, composition that he made. Um, Victor Nodov's uh, Spice Bomb or Flower Bomb. I mean, both are interesting, but I don't know if he did both or just one of them. Also very fascinating, but those are very specific fragrances that have a special type of screechy, and that's another word I used for this one in the initial um, smelling or testing of it, um, a certain screechiness to them that Chanel fragrances don't have. And I know he's, he's kind of holding back. He can't really just do what he wants to do because he's in the house of Chanel now. He has to deliver some sort of Chanel, Chanelified philosophy of fragrance and poetry to fragrance because he has to kind of keep that vocabulary alive, that, that olfactory vocabulary alive. And of course, as we say, vitamin B. Daddy was working for Chanel his whole life. Now the son gets the job. Wow, what a cliche. But the son already worked as a perfumer before, you know, hitting up Coco and starting to work for her. So I wonder, all that prestige, Olivier, I get it. It's a huge house. It's a huge prestige. But I think you lost your freedom. I think for your own sake, you should have, you should have kindly declined the offer to work for uh, the perfume Maison Chanel because you're not made for Chanel. You're, made, you're, 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 you're making incredible fragrances. But you're, you're meant to make other types of fragrances, not Chanel fragrances. This one has these 20 minutes of flowers in there where we, where we sense Chanel, but the opening is not Chanel and the dry down is, is not even there. And I think the dry down is so subdued and kind of you've been castrating yourself, you know, we're missing that explosion because, well, because had you created the, the explosion that you're, that we're so used to from your fragrances that you didn't do for Chanel, but prior to, then I would expect some sort of bombastic, you know, twist and an experimentation in ingredients and also, you know, artificial ingredients. Why not? It's all fine at the end of the day, do whatever you want to do, but you couldn't really do that for Chanel. So we got something that feels a little bit castrated. It doesn't really go anywhere, but it makes us feel like it's trying really hard. And that's not what Gabrielle is. That's not what she was when she was growing up. And I know Chanel is investing a lot of money in marketing and they're going to brainwash all of us and we're all going to love it. But, uh, you know, try to kind of compare it to everything else that you love to smell and be honest with yourselves. I mean, it's also an expensive fragrance. It's one of the most expensive eau de parfums mass, in mass release terms uh, considering. And Every time I try, you know, when I make my perfume reviews, I try to go on a journey. 
I try to let a fragrance take me on a journey. This one kind of blocks me off because every time I want to fall into it and I want to fall into this precipice and, and enjoy it and, and devour the fragrance and let it take me somewhere, it doesn't take me anywhere. Those 20 minutes of flowers that I get, they make me believe that something amazing is going to happen at the end of that abstract flowery meadow where some of the flowers are artificial and some are natural. But then I run at the, at the edge of that meadow and then there's just like a wall, like a, like a glass, you know, maybe even this crystal, no, it's crystal, it's glass, but thin glass wall in front of me and I can't go further. It won't let me go further because it just stops smelling. And it's a quick fragrance. It's a fragrance you can refresh a lot. It's a fragrance you could use in the office a lot. You know, it just wants to be clean. It wants to be lovable. It wants to be loved. And it's slightly desperate in that way. This desperation is something that I'm sensing more and more from the company, Chanel. But it was not Coco Chanel. She was never desperate. And um, this, you know... Apparently, Olivier loves his orangey and citrusy tones and grapefruit. That ain't Chanel. Stop with it. Why do you have to keep making perfumes with it in there? And then on top of it all, you know, the sandalwood, the musk, the black currant, they're all synthetic. They all smell really synthetic in here. This is a luxury brand that's supposed to pave the way for all other brands, you know, to kind of, it should be some sort of beacon of light, a guiding star for, for others to follow to, you know, in, in terms of revolution. If you're a luxury brand that's earning billions, trillions, I don't know how much you're earning every year, um, you have to be the one that's daring to pave the way for others to follow. You should not be the one who dictates, let's play it safe. Heaven forbid we were to lose a, a million billion because we don't trust the, the, the consumers to actually be open for something new and different. Well, you're selling yourself too short and you're also selling us too short. Yes, it will sell because you invested billions in marketing. So you're gonna have that initial kick of selling, but this will never be number five. This will never be number 22. This will never be Gardenia. This will never be Sycamore, never, never. Mark my words. And um, even on Fleur de Chanel, which has been discontinued, this one here, it's so beautiful. It's very simple, very aquatic. You know, it has that jasmine in there that is just so beautiful and almost like a liquid ceramic-y milk. And it's just so clean, simple, but poetic. Very Chanel. Very, very. It's like a hidden treasure, like a hidden Chanel that you, like a hidden flower that the only smelling camellia that you would find in this huge garden next to the water. And that would be this fragrance. And it's still Chanel, even though it's very simplified. Um, and it's so beautifully creamy. It almost has hints of number 22, not in the way it smells, but in the way of that creaminess and resinous creaminess that that kind of number 22 delivers with its dry down. This one here is a synthetic mess. And um, those 20 minutes are already gone on my hands, so the flowers are gone. And now I'm hitting that cheap dry down which is really I'm sorry Chanel but like this is a huge disappointment it really doesn't deliver actually you know it smells the best out of the bottle which is super strange usually out of the bottle Chanel fragrances smell they bite you a little they, they have the aldehydes in there that kind of tend to um to bite you a little bit but this one is like again developed to be a pleasant bestseller for at least a season and mind you if this were had this been a flanker and you're just like creating some summery or late summery fragrance or early fall fragrance to, to sell to your customers then so be it but 15 years we're waiting and you're telling us this will be revolutionary because it's been 15 years since Chanel launched a new fragrance that wasn't a flanker and you're telling us this is going to be the new number five the new number 22 the new gardenia the new sycamore are you kidding me how dare you make fun of us thinking that we're so gullible and stupid to believe uh that this is a new number five a new gardenia a new number 22 it, it ain't it saddens me really because um 
There was so much potential. A company that is so powerful, that has everything, that could concoct in terms of perfumery, in terms of fashion, everything. They could revolutionize the world if they wanted to, if they just wanted to take that risk. And that's just that one thing that the company Chanel is just not ready to do at the moment. They're just not ready to do it. Not at all. And that's why I believe Coco herself would have not approved. But then again, you know, that's just my opinion. Who am I to judge? You know, I'm not judging the people that are going to like this one. This is, it's easy to like. And if you're the type of person who's going to like this, because you like it, it's easy to like, and then you're going to think, oh, well, and plus it's called Chanel, so I'm having a branded fragrance, great. If that's enough for you to justify it, go for it. But you're being fooled and tricked into paying much more money for something that isn't worth all that money just because it has a brand. I know everything luxury branded is overpriced anyway, but there's a certain amount of design and research that goes into certain pieces that to me justifies the cause. That's just me again. Here I can't justify anything. And even the fact that they're selling me the fact that the bottle is super flat on all sides and how incredible and difficult it is to make. I don't care. You should have wasted less time in the freaking bottle and invested more time in creating the juice that kind of, you know, knocks my head off. Enough ranting. Uh, that was my review, guys. No travel, no trip. The only trip that you can save yourself is going to the perfume counter to buy this one. Travel somewhere else. And you know, I love my Chanel and uh, I love my Les Exclusives or the Toilettes. And um, I, you know, I would do just about anything to, to try out everything that Chanel is doing. Uh, but uh, this one, this one really disappoints me on so many levels, uh, in so many different respects that it's, it's really hard for me to, to find anything positive and I have found positive things but all in all it's an okay perfume but it's not an okay Chanel perfume thank you guys so much for watching hope you like this review if you have please do thumb it up and let me know what you thought in the comment section down below and if you haven't already but do wish to please consider subscribing to my channel here on YouTube I'm also on Instagram Facebook and Twitter so no matter how good or bad a pray a pray I would say fragrance and perfume is or are, you still got to stay connected with your inner core and yourself. Don't let marketing brainwash you. Figure out for yourself what is pleasant to your nose. Give yourself time to figure that out. And the only way you can give yourself time to figure that out is if you never give up on love. Love you guys. See you soon. Take care. Bye.